I thought today we would, which is always a little bit of a dangerous thing to do, which is kind of follow up on what we were doing last week. Dangerous only because the people who are here week to week differ <laughs> based on people's schedules and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so if you weren't here last week, well, that's okay. I'll, I'll, but, what, but here's what I want to do. So in our discussion last week, we ended up talking some about suffering and, um, and we talked about the, I, the understanding that the cross can be a source of comfort. Now, that the idea of a suffering God, a God who himself suffers, can be a source of comfort. And maybe the only real source of comfort because the why of our suffering may remain unknown to us, right? But that raises a real problem if you have a, what I would consider, a misguided understanding of the cross. Then the cross is not in any way comforting. In fact, it's fairly disturbing. (laughs) So I want to talk about how we view the cross and why some of us would have asserted, oh, when I'm suffering, the cross can be a comfort to me. And a sense of God being with me in my trials, right? So, and, and this was raised last week by Derek. Of course, he's not here, so I'm, 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 raising, you know, I'm raising the point he raised um, with me after class. He said, well, maybe next week you, you can explain how, you know, how the, how the cross um, can essentially be that sort of comfort. So it depends on how you view the cross. The way I grew up understanding it, and I imagine most of you probably did as well, was that God needs to kill somebody. And he, by all rights, should kill me because I'm a sinner, right? So God has to kill somebody. And the only way he can forgive me, who deserves to die, and he ought to kill me for my sin, is, well, he can kill a substitute. Right? He, can, he can kill someone else in my place and therefore forgive me. Right? This is what we call substitutionary atonement. Actually, we call it penal substitutionary atonement because it's the idea that Jesus steps in and takes my punishment from the Father. Right? That's the way I was taught. I was given numerous illustrations as to why that was the case and why I need to think about it that way. But the real problem with that is, well, then when you say, well, in my suffering, I look to the cross and find comfort. No, I actually look to the cross and realize that should be happening to me. And and I'm kind of, well, scared of the God who by all rights should be crucifying me. Like the... The crucifixion of Jesus is God getting what God demands. The agonizing death of somebody. Right? God can't forgive us unless he gets paid in blood. Right? That's how the story has been told. Um, So you might think, well, how else do we look at it? Here's how I would say it. It is not the will of God the Father that Jesus die a horrific death on the cross. The will of God the Father is that Jesus come into the world and love us no matter what we do to him. The mission is go love the world like I love the world no matter what they do to you. The plan is not go down there and suffer an agonizing death which will make me happy, right? Like if you, if you get tortured, then that solves my problem of how I can be forgiving. The Father is not sending the Son to an agonizing death. 
He's sending the son to love despite the fact that we say crucify him. Now, is the death of you know, is the death of Christ somehow according to the will of God? Well, yes, because he wanted Jesus to love even to the point of death, death on a cross. But it's not like God the Father is like, oh, I'm really enjoying watching my son die because this is what I've willed from all eternity is this agony. Know that the way this change, what this does is we realize the Father is in as much agony over the cross as the Son is. And the Father does not want the agonizing death that we as humans place upon Jesus. What the fathers say is, go love them. I know they're going to want to kill you. Keep loving them anyway, because that's what I do. I love them when they, when they reject me. I love them when they don't believe in me. I love them when they mock me. So you go show them my love, even when they want to kill you. Don't stop loving. Now that, if we look at it as as Jesus' mission is to love to the point of death, then when we look at the, when we see the cross, what we see is a picture of God loving even though it means entering into suffering. That's why we could be talking last week about the cross being a comfort to us when we're suffering. Because it's not a, a picture of a God who's like, well, sorry you're suffering. <laughs> At least it's not me. <laughs> you know, it, it's not like God is somehow distant from it. God in his love takes on our suffering. So the picture of the cross is there's a God who's not afraid to suffer because he loves no matter what. Then when I'm suffering, I'm assured that God is loving me and actually will willingly suffer with me. Just like all of us who have children know when our children are suffering, the parents are suffering just as much, right? They're, they're suffering just as much as the children are, or maybe even more, right? Your child's getting picked on in school or something and ostracized and you're just, it's just tearing you apart. You want them to have a good experience and yet they're being made fun of, right? So what, what we would be saying is, is the cross shows us a picture of the eternal, unquenchable love of God in any and all extreme circumstances and that he will then willingly join us in the midst of our suffering. That's a different picture. Now, um, well, we're told to rejoice when we're persecuted. Yeah. And that one's been a tough one for me over the years. Uh, see, Christ, you know, going to the grave, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so it's, it's similar to when James talks about consider it pure joy, you know, and you're thinking, how can I consider pure joy when you suffer all these sorts of trials and temptations? Okay, I don't think that in either case, or in the Beatitudes, you know, blessed are those you know, who are persecuted. You know, blessed are you when men persecute you and say all manner of evil against you for my name's sake. You know, it's, it's not that we enjoy or find joyful the actual suffering itself. We're, we don't have to be masochists to be Christians. Like, I love to feel pain. You know, that, that's a disordered thing, right? Masochism would be a disordered psychological state. But I think what it's getting at is that there is a joy, a superseding joy that is present even in this time and maybe even through this, I see that. So I don't think anything calls me to actually have to like whatever, persecution or have to like trials. But what James is getting at is, but you know that this is working to build patience and patience builds character. So. It's like if you, if you desire yourself to grow closer to God, you know that although the circumstances are still 
awful and you wish they would not be the case, you can still find joy because you know, even so, something good can transpire despite this, right? And I would say something similar about the beatitude about blessed are you when men persecute you. I mean, of course I don't like it, but God is present with me, right? And, and so there are, despite the part of it that I don't like, there are parts of it that I can find redemptive. That, I don't know, it's hard to distinguish those two. Yeah, we don't have to enjoy the, the negative. And, and any more than Jesus enjoyed the cross, he didn't, he agonized about it, but the way the Hebrew writer says it, he, he had his, his attention fixed on the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Right? It's like he had something beyond that, and so he could get through that because he had something beyond that. And, and we're in that same situation, and the comfort is knowing God goes with us on that path, on the path through the valley of the shadow of death. He's with us. Nobody likes the valley of the shadow of death metaphorically in Psalm 23, right? Nobody likes that. But to know that I have a shepherd who shepherds me through it and who's not like, Ooh, well, you know, good luck as you go through that. I don't go through that. No, who willingly says, I'll go through that with you. Even though I don't need to, I will. I'll accompany you. And I'll take on the pain. That I find to be the only real comfort in times of meaningless suffering. You know what I'm saying? Where it's just like, why in the world does this happen? And there is no logic. There's no good reason. It's just awful. Well, what comfort do I take? Well, at least I'm not alone. And what tells me I'm not alone? Well, look at the cross. God enters into unneeded suffering because of great love. And in that sense, he takes it on. Okay, Ken, you have a thought? I was just going to ask, because you've done classes on this before, but the way you describe, you know, divine self-offering of God in Christ terms of entering into our suffering what do you think it's that it's you know everybody has all these categories they like to have for atonement theories and everything do you think that's not the way to do you, do you think it's having an atonement theory is a little restricted and is does that does what you just described what what is being accomplished in the cross in terms of what or is that even a good question? Well, there's, there's, right. <laughs> uh, the mystery of the cross yeah. and all that's happening in it, something's happening in the cross as well, which is the removal of our sin. Right. Um, I don't think it's the appeasing of, of God. Like, God's bloodthirsty. When he gets satiated with the blood of Jesus, he's like, okay, I'm now over it. <laughs> like, I got to drink in his blood. And, I, you know, that kind of, that's really a pagan view of God. And unfortunately, it's a very popular Christian view is that Jesus dies to mollify his father's wrath. Um, and, and that the father's wrath dissipates when he gets to beat the living tar out of Jesus. Uh, my reading of the gospel is it's Satan who puts Jesus on the cross because he enters into a bunch of people. <laughs> it's, it's not the father saying crucify him. It's the people saying crucify him. It's the father telling the son, stay the course, love him anyway. This is horrific, love him. Um, but there's a mystery, right? Maybe the passage we can look at um, is 1 John 4, 10 and 11. And there's a, there's a number of atonement theories. I think they all have certain value. There is a certain value to understanding Jesus took my place. Okay? This substitutionary idea, he did take my place. But he didn't take my place and take the beating from his father. He took my place and took the beating from the devil. Right? Read Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis. It is the witch who wants to kill Aslan. And Aslan says, take me instead of Edmund. 
right? Who, who, who inflicts all the pain on Aslan? The witch, the devil, right? C.S. Lewis has his atonement substitutionary idea right, okay? There's too many people say, no, Jesus is taking the anger of his father. No, he's taking on the anger of the devil who wants to destroy him. And Jesus says, fine, do your best. And of course, the devil can't destroy him because even though he kills him, the father raises him. Says, the father is always for, the father is not, does not enjoy, is not appeased by the son's death, does not will in that sense the son's death. The father wills the love of the son like the father through everything, no matter what, so that finally the world can, has no reason to believe God is anything but love, right? So, so, there, so the, the atonement theory about substitution has value. It's just you've got to know who's inflicting the pain on Jesus. It's not the father. It's the devil, right? You can't mix those two up. That would be a grave error theologically is to, to think God is acting like the devil. I'm being a little facetious, but, you know, it's like, yeah, we've made that mistake sometimes. We've attributed to God the actions of the devil. Like God would love to see his son die. Hello? He's a God of life. He's not a God of death, you know? Okay, so th there's value to that. There's value to the other theories as well, like the moral theory, which is saying that there is a kind of influence morally on us when we see the death of Jesus. It does spur us to, to, to think differently, to have a different conception, right? So they all have certain value. I don't think any of them stand out as the solution. The, the idea is they all speak legitimately, and there's about four or five very significant ones historically, and they're all speaking to a certain part of it but none of them sufficiently to the whole of it. But here's a, here's a verse. Uh, well, Daryl, you had your hand up, so maybe. I'll let you finish when you're done. Okay. Well, so let's look at 1 John 4, 10 and 11. Now, he, here's where what I'm saying is where I'm getting it from. <laughs> well, not only here, but here is one of the places I'm getting this from. So verse 10, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now that's the whole question is what is that, what, what is the nature of that being that sacrifice? And some people say, well, it's God needed to kill something and so he killed Jesus instead of us. I'd say, no, I'd say, no, I think you missed the point. Um, he is an atoning sacrifice, and it does result in the removal of our sins, but that's not because God got the blood he demanded. That's because Jesus loved like Jesus needed to, like the Father wanted him to, right? Um, so in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the one who dies on the cross for our sins, right? You can put it that way. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. So what John sees in the cross is a demonstration of love that is to be emulated. If the cross was a demonstration of the wrath of God that instead of being poured out on humanity was poured out on the Son... Exactly what am I emulating, <laughs> right? What am I emulating? So th there's a lot of problems with the view I was taught. Um, but that would be one of them because what he derives from he came to be this atoning sacrifice is now love one another because what is the cross? It's God loving us before we loved him. That's what you see in the cross is, is perfect love, not wrath demanding its, its pound of flesh. You see perfect love in the cross. Therefore, now you know how to be cross-like with others. Love them. Well, they offend me. Love them anyway. Isn't that what the cross says? You love them even if they're killing you. So what John derives from Christ coming and being that sacrifice is now you live 
lovingly towards others with the same limitless kind of unconditional way the Father loved by sending Jesus. Right? So John doesn't see anything in here about appeasement of wrath or something like that. John sees portrayal of love and therefore something to emulate. Right? So is it correct or incorrect that Jesus God allows these trials in our lives. Specifically, He allows them. And that's almost like saying He makes orchestrates them. them. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I would, yeah, I would, uh, I would be very hesitant to, to choose that language mm -hmm. because w what do I know? I know this is happening. What don't I know? Why in the heck it is? I mean, well, God ordained it from the very beginning that this would happen to you. Well, that's pretty disturbing if that's the case. Why would he plan for this misery? But even if you soften a little bit, well, he's just allowing it for a greater good. Well, I wish he would allow it. You know, it's like, you know, the thing is, I'm, it's still, all I know is it's happened. I don't know why it's happened. So I would even... I, I personally wouldn't use the language of allow. What I would say, again, I would go back to, I know he's with me in this moment. And he, he's suffering with me even more than I am. He's more heartbroken about whatever is going on with me than I am. And I'm pretty, I'm pretty you know, in, much in pain about it. He even more. And how? Willingly so, Right? That's, that's the whole idea of I can find some comfort, not because I can understand why, but because I can understand who is with me. If I were alone, that would be even worse. It's bad already, but if you're not alone, it's, a, it's somewhat better. But nobody says, well, that makes it wonderful. <laughs> Still horrible, but at least you're not alone. And to me, that's what the cross is saying. You're never alone in your suffering. God entered into it, and he didn't need to. But he did anyway. And he did it out of love. So, okay, Marcia, you had a... Well, I've heard this quote, and I'm not sure you know, what to think about it, not what you said, but it, that God protects us from nothing but sustains us in everything. Maybe you know who said that. I don't know, but I have heard that. I, I, um, I'm not sure what you said. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> Yeah, the, the allow idea is still, and I'm not sure about this idea of God. Um, the idea that God is kind of a master chess player moving all the pieces on the table. Mm -hmm. And allowing it is still insinuates that he could move the chess pieces a certain way, but he decided not to. And maybe let the devil move a piece. Mm -hmm. I just don't know if... if the, Where would it stop then? <laughs> <laughs> so if he allows this piece, which is painful for me but not bigger than me maybe is he allowing wars is he allowing child abuse is he allowing for for i mean where do you stop right. and how do you say well this is where he allows but this is not him allowing right how do you yeah and and you still have a more to me a morally questionable god who allows child abuse and who allows the Holocaust, you know, and who allow he could do something about it, but he doesn't. My is that he doesn't protect you from anything. Right. My my sense is my sense is what I can say is all of this grieves God in an infinite way and he enters into it with us. And he promises I am gonna set this world right. Right? There will be a new heavens and new earth, and I will eventually cast, you know, the last enemy to be, to be defeated is death. Death, every, all that goes into the lake of fire. The devil, you know, I'm going to set this right. But I don't understand, yeah, I don't know, it is what it is. All I know is this is what's happening. Um, and God hates it. <laughs> and he's going to ultimately do something, but I don't know what. You know, you say, why not now? Well, that would that would bring, you know, and and everything. What? 
I was going to say, I think the most basic thing is that God created us with free choice. And as a result of that, and as a result of our sinful nature, we live in a broken world. Yeah. So bad things happen. And, um, and yes, he's going to make that right at some point, but we're going to continue living in this broken world until we go to be with him. Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't understand... I don't understand because we even talk today. Well, why doesn't why doesn't God change the nature of the world? Why did He make it this way? All those questions I don't have answers for. But we know well. This is what we experience: a fallen, broken world that is where death is present, pain happens, suffering happens. The question is, how do you live in this world? And all major religions are trying to answer that question. So. The first principle, and this is according to Scott Peck, who was a Buddhist when he wrote the book, The Road Less Traveled, he starts off and he says the first principle of Buddhism is life is difficult. Right. So what are the Buddhists trying to answer? Life is difficult. How then do you live be, given the nature of life? Christianity is doing the same thing. Jesus is doing the same thing. Life is difficult. How then do you live? How do you how do you deal with suffering? How do you deal with temptation? How do you deal with disappointment? And I think every major religion is trying, is wrestling with that same reality is there's pain and suffering in life. What in the world do we do to try and live through these realities? I can't explain as to, I mean, we can say, like you said, generally, we know the world has fallen, sin has entered in, it's corrupted things. But it is what it is at this point. And the promise is it will be set right. The comfort to me is, and God walks with us through the valley. of He is my shepherd all the time, good and bad, <coughs> things going well, things not going well. Yeah, and like Marcia said, and he, he's not protecting me from people who made fun of me in school and called me four eyes. You know, I mean, he's not keeping that from happening. That, that's what kids do to I make fun of kids, other kids too, so, you know. <laughs> it wasn't like I was an angel. Yeah, I got made fun of, and I made fun of other kids. I picked on other kids sometimes. So that just, that happens, and he's not keeping that from happening. But before you move on, because I do think that, I don't want to get you off track, but you have, thousands, you have hundreds of conversations in the course of a year with different people. For the person that does insist, and words fail, right? We, we all said we, we can't satisfactorily answer the why on the evil and stuff. But for the person that insists on, what's your best limping answer of the why? If you're, if you're going to try to, because I mean, I could, I could spout off all the things about, you know, well, if love demands freedom, freedom, you know, yeah, I freedom mean, freedom has, I mean, Okay. Which, when you start saying it like that, it just it can ring a little hollow. But at the same time, somebody, some people really want to camp out with the why question. Right. Hey, I'll go to David Bentley Hart because I heard him answer the kind of question. You know, couldn't have God made? Couldn't God have made the world differently? And his answer was, Well, God could have made a thousand different worlds, but there's only one way to make us, and that's the idea of. If he's going to make us free with the capacity to love as moral beings, then there's only one way to make us. So it is kind of going to the point that if the whole object is for me to learn to be like God, the, then I have to be given this kind of situation where in my freedom I can learn to love. And we all know if it's if if love is coerced, it's not love. It's, it's just, you know, it's hollow. It's just motions without heart. It has to be willingly given. So I would go in that direction. That still may be unsatisfactory, but the, the point is, um, yeah, for me to grow and mature, which means to become more like God, I need a situation like I'm facing. Um, it would be morally reprehensible for God if he did not fix it in the end. <laughs> then it would be truly like, 
now I'm questioning his his wisdom, his choices. Right? But if he promises to fix it, then I can say, okay, maybe I can somehow live through all of this. As much as it raises questions and answers are satisfactory, if if it will be fixed, maybe then I'll know better as to why it all was like it was. I'm just thinking, uh, uh, as a secular way of trying to understand the cross, you know, in Plato's Republic, yeah. uh, he actually comes up with this hypothetical thing of talking about what happens if there's a truly righteous man. And I'm paraphrasing, but he says, oh, he'd be scourged and he'd be crucified. Yeah. And that was written 350 years, plus or minus, from the time of Christ's crucifixion. Yeah. So I think... He's describing the nature of man and what we would do with a truly righteous man. Mm -hmm. And for me, that kind of helped me, I guess, take the pressure or burden away from God and say it's it's actually us. Yeah. This is what we do to a righteous man. Yeah, which Plato's suggestion would, was then it's actually better to appear to be righteous than actually be righteous. <laughs> I mean, that was his view. Is that like if you if there's a really righteous man, yeah. It was like they'll put his eyes out, they'll beat him, they'll, and they'll crucify him. And that's what Plato says 350 years before Jesus. And he's right. If there's a really righteous person, we'll, we'll crucify him. So, yeah, it's, it's the cross, or here's how I like it. I've heard it said this way by theologians. The crucifixion is the awful death. The cross is what God turns the crucifixion into. The crucifixion is what we do to Jesus. The cross is what God then gives to us. The cross is about love, eternal forgiveness, no matter what. The crucifixion is all about hatred, jealousy, fear, and sin. Right? Yeah. So we we heap all that on Jesus and do that to him. God, in kind of a spiritual alchemy, turns it into something else and presents us with the cross. <coughs> which is, lo and behold, the means by which we are saved from the very things we, we did to him, we're saved from them. So I, I like that kind of juxtaposition of the crucifixion is the horrible death, the cross is the overcoming love of God that even overcomes the cruelty of the crucifixion. Right? That, right. That's a way of saying, okay, Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep, I can. Okay. Um, thank you for this. Um, thank you for the first John 4 reference. I, I'm wondering, okay, so this idea of God's wrath. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Isaiah 53, the Lord laid on him. Um, 2 Corinthians 5 made him to be sin who knew no sin. I'm guessing that's where people sort of get the idea of wrath or maybe maybe it's the propitiation because there's blood involved um do you think laying on him the iniquity or making him to be sin who knew no sin is is painful or uh, i know you would think it's loving right but maybe maybe is it painful yeah well i think i th think what those how I would interpret those passages is yes they're saying but this is this is father and son in concert in full oneness saying I take upon myself Jesus is saying all the sin and cruelty of the world which in a very literal sense he did because it was their jealousy it was the jealousy of the re Jewish leaders who who were jealous that the crowds liked him. I mean, they literally, their sinful attitudes towards him were literally inflicted upon him, right? They kill him to get him out of the way. So in that sense, yes, he takes upon himself all of our sin and he bears it, right? Even though he himself had not done it. So... That's how I see that. Um, the, the question is, to me, is that satisfying a, a need God has to kill somebody? 
And there's where I disagree, that God needs to kill anybody to be forgiving. Um, so, yes, so I, he does all the iniquity get taken on by the son? Yes. And in that sense, Isaiah can foresee it being laid on him? Yes. Um, but that's not because God needs a scapegoat. The thing is, Jesus is the Passover lamb. He's not the scapegoat. Right? Do you, do you know the difference between the scapegoat was the goat that symbolically they laid the hands on it bore all of Israel's sins and then it was driven out of the camp we have described Jesus more like he is not the Passover lamb he is the scapegoat of the day of atonement the Passover lamb which Jesus says he is and he dies on Passover the Passover lamb was not a sacrifice for sin read Exodus they did not offer the Passover lamb, lamb as an atonement for the sins of the Israelites. Because if you read in Leviticus, a, Passover, a, a sin offering you were forbidden to eat. But the Passover lamb, they are commanded to eat all of it and leave none of it till morning. So what is the Passover lamb? The Passover lamb is the way in which Israel is freed from their slavery. It is not a sin offering. It is a offering of freedom, fellowship with God, and, and their own liberation. And Jesus dies at Passover saying, I'm the Passover lamb. We've described him more as the, the goat of atonement, not the lamb of Passover. Right? So, I, I, I mean, I agree that those passages, you know, like Jesus was made to be sin for us. Again, I think that's speaking... Um, well, it's still make, speaking metaphorically, but it's true, very true. It's he so willingly says, let me bear all of it out of love that in essence he becomes the very sin that he himself had never committed. Yeah, I, I, if that makes sense, John David, I mean, I totally, obviously I totally agree with those passages. I just don't think they're mollifying the anger of God. I just think they're, they're dealing with a, our sin and they're expiating it, which means to take it away. It's taking away our sin. Yeah, it's the idea of um, the Passover being a, a protective right. sacrifice. Right, yeah. it, right. They're protected by the lamb who delivers them from their slavery. The blood of the lamb wins their freedom. That's more about what we're saying about the cross and what Jesus is saying about his own death and what Paul says when he says in, in 1 Corinthians about, you know, the, the Passover, let us keep the Passover. And he's talking about Holy Communion because it's, that's what it is. It was established at Passover. It's the meal of fellowship about protection and freedom and, and winning our liberty from, from sin and death. That's what we're participating in. I mean, uh, the table is not a sin offering. The bread and the cup are not sin offerings. They're offerings of fellowship that bind us to God in the liberation God provides. Right? It's, not a, it's not an offering of sin played out on the table. <laughs> right. All right. Um, well, 12 o'clock, and obviously we will never solve uh, how ultimately to think about the atonement or the cross. I'm just trying to point us, I think, in a little more helpful direction, especially if last week you were confused we're saying, well, we're suffering and we find comfort in the cross. And my old way of thinking is like, no, the cross always makes me scared because that's what God would want to do to me. Love him, I need to, but love him, I don't. Right? I remember as a, as a conscientious Preteen praying every night, Lord, God, help me to love you because I knew I needed to and I had no way of knowing how I could because he was the most terrifying being in my world, was the God who would cast me eternally into hell, who, who sent Jesus to the cross because that's what he wants to do to me. 
and I'm supposed to love him? I'm scared to death of God, right? And I'm scared to death not to love him, right? But I know deep in my heart, I don't. I feel no closeness, no affection, no safety with this God, right? That's awful when you're 9, 10, 11 years old and you're, you're mortified of the God who's supposed to love you, right? That's what I'm trying to help others say. You don't have to go through that. And if you've been there, you don't have to be there. The cross is comforting to us, not terrifying, like that should be me. <laughs> no, God doesn't want that to be me. He would never do that to me. Now, if I tend to follow Jesus, if I choose to do that, some other people may want to do that to me, but the, my father never would. This right? God that you talk about is good all the way through. He's good all the way through. There is no darkness. He's light, all light. No darkness in him at all, right? No anger to be appeased. No, nothing like that exists in God, right? Okay, well, we'll stop there. Hope you can stay for the lunch.